Love is the greatest healer. I'm so fortunate to know love and to have survived my experiences to be here tonight to speak out on the subject of mind control. Thank you, all of you, each and every one of you, for coming out here to arm yourself with this pertinent information. Love is the greatest motive for me to speak out on this subject because it is my love for humanity that compels me to bring this truth to light. I'm deeply concerned for our survival if we don't learn this information. The experience that I had could have left me very bitter and vengeful and hateful, but it is none of those negatives that compel me to speak out at all because I find that those kind of negatives actually um, hinder my ability to even think clearly. If I'm outraged, I'm not even capable of, of, of thinking so well. Besides, negativity tends to feed the energy of the criminals that are in control of our government right now, manipulating the minds of all of us. Now that I'm free to speak out, and now that I know love, um, it feels so good to realize that there are good people in this world, that there is good and bad running through everything. Here we are speaking in a church, and yet a church was so much a part of my abuse. So again, there's good and bad in everything. There's good and bad in government. There's good and bad even in the CIA. Mark Phillips is some powerful evidence to me that there are people in intelligence who have integrity and soul and compassion. And that was a real eye-opener for me because my whole world was covered in abuse. My whole world was one where I couldn't see beyond my experiences of the moment. I couldn't even think to hope anymore. I lost that ability at about age six. How it happened was that I was born into a multi-generational incest-based family like so many other people are. There's certainly nothing rare about it. Child abuse is so pervasive on our planet. All we need to do is open our eyes and look around us to see how widespread that it is. The sexual abuse that I experienced left my sexuality heightened, which is very common in a situation like that. And I'm sure that Dr. Lois Lee has seen so many of these children that, like myself, end up on the streets as prostitutes with their sexuality being exploited even further because of abuse that they'd already endured in childhood. It's absolutely atrocious the extent of the abuse that's going on for systematic, deliberate reasons and for reasons that have just become a so-called norm, a natural part of our society. Because after three generations of an attitude of sexual abuse, it becomes autogenic within a family unit. That's why I said that I'm from a multi-generational incest-based family. My mother was sexually abused, my father was sexually abused, and the sexual abuse just goes all up the family tree. I don't see that as their excuse for abusing me sexually whatsoever. I ended up with a like a, a hundredth monkey syndrome is something where I didn't have that natural propensity to continue that abuse or to even accept it and to think that it's the way things should be. As a matter of fact, it was so traumatic to me that I developed dissociative identity disorder, a formerly termed multiple personality disorder. It's not that I could think to judge my father when he abused me. It wasn't like that at all. I mean, I, I was so very young. It happened as far back as I can remember. And he often bragged that he substituted his penis for my mother's nipple. So it was very early on. I also know that my father was like that with my brothers and sisters that came along in later years. 
So it was way before I could morally judge such a thing or before I had any kind of mental concept of how life should be. Instead, my brain automatically kicked in. When the abuse occurred, it began to compartmentalize the trauma of that event so that the rest of my mind could function normally. My father's sexual abuse of me was horrific because it, it suffocated me and it caused a lot of pain as a very, very young infant. At the same time, it put my sexuality into a survival mode uh, that was the equivalent of breathing or eating or drinking. It was just a very, became a very strong base instinct. The Hitler-Himmler research had already uh, determined that this was what happens in the human brain when any time abuse occurs. And when abuse occurs, where the brain begins to section off the abuse so the rest of the mind can function normally, there becomes less and less conscious mind to um, be able to think through exactly what is happening. They were very much interested in this because if the traumas are repeated enough and there's enough compartmentalization created in the brain, then the subconscious mind is left wide open to being manipulated and easily led. That was what they wanted for uh, mass mind control in a society. It's what they wanted for the, that kind of Manchurian candidate attitude and for being able to manipulate ultimately um, the politics of the planet as well as the population as a whole. These experiments that Dr. Ross referred to were so heavily going on when I was born in 1957 that by the early 60s, mind control was in full swing. The CIA was taking information from what the Catholics had long since learned about the effects of trauma on the human mind when they did the Spanish Inquisition and the Crusades. And they would found out how people responded to that kind of trauma, that kind of torture. And it was so strong on the population, as a matter of fact, that it ended up where the few free thinkers that were left went underground and secret societies began forming and, and spinning off that. I'm not saying secret societies are right or that they're good, but they came from a horrible, torturous, abuse that was going on that was trying to control people and steer them into one belief rather than leaving them to their own normal development. Project Paperclip was, had already happened and the Nazi and fascist scientists from Hitler's Nazi Germany were brought into the United States and the information was being combined with this information from the Catholics that the CIA was combining into a very powerful form of mind control. The MK Ultra mind control projects were very strong, but they weren't just experimental at the time that I was in. They were already absolute. They knew exactly what they were doing. And they even had it established where they had a certain faction of the government set up to target children like myself who were suffering from dissociative identity disorder where the memory of the abuse was compartmentalized into those, those different compartments. Along with that compartmentalization comes a 44 times visual acuity because it's like you get these eyes in the back of your head to see if the abuse is coming. And when people have been horribly traumatized, you'll notice that their eyes are wide open. And very often you see the whites around their eyes. Their blink responses aren't, aren't even proper. But that's because the body is going into this mode of you know, trying to stop the problem before it happens again, or is trying to stop the traumas and the horrors before they occur again. Um, additionally, the, it's like the, we, we use 10% of our brain. I've, I've heard figures 8 to 10% of our brains is, is about what we use. Well, when you have that kind of abuse, it like blasts you into other parts of your brain. And so you end up in other part, using other parts that most people never get to because they don't even know that it exists yet. 